Things Jelly Spoons, just before we get into this video, a very quick content and trigger warning. Some of the things I'm going to talk about will not be okay for everybody to listen to. If that is you, that is absolutely fine. I hope you have an amazing night. Please come back in a future video, but please avoid this one if you are not happy with listening to any of the following. The sexualization of children, homophobia, transphobia, any issues around the LGBTQ plus community, gender identity, anything about sexuality, abuse and death. If you're uncomfortable listening to any of these topics, then I look forward to seeing you hopefully in the next video, but this one is definitely not for you. Thank you, Jelly Spoons. Let's get into it. As you may expect, there will also be spoilers for the entire text of Peter Darling. If you haven't read it, good, don't read it. I'm going to explain why. The work I'm going to be discussing today, Peter Darling by Austin Chant, takes a canonically child character and ages him up to be a part of explicitly sexual non-PG content. Now, I did look into the arguments for and against aging up characters because I like to know different sides of the story. And the argument that I saw most often in favour of, oh, aging up characters is fine and should be acceptable, was this. All children eventually do grow up and become adults. They will have an adult life. Therefore, looking ahead into the future of these characters and creating content about them as adults and their adult lives should be fine as long as it is expressly explained that they have been aged up to an appropriate age. The trouble I have with this argument is that, one, the child's personality is more often than not not aged up with them, or has been done so quite poorly, which makes them read just as they did when they were a minor. Also, aging up a child character just to be able to explore sexual content with them strikes me as very unsettlingly wrong. If, say, you want to explore a adult character who can fight and has the ability to fly, and you want to write about their specific sexual or gender experiences, and for some reason you do not wish to use Nemesis, Dracula, Alucard, Superman, Batman, Maleficent, or any number of other adult characters, why then not create your own character who can fly and fight? one who is of age. It starts to feel very fixated on using this particular child character, and I have to wonder why. Seeing a child character and immediately thinking, what would their adult life, and I mean adult life, be like, just does not sit right with me. Now, I do hear and I do understand the argument that children grow up, characters grow up, eventually they will be a grown-up. And if we were talking about any other character, I may actually be inclined to agree. However, the one massive swinging wrecking ball of a rebuttal that I have to that argument in the case of Peter Darling is that Peter Pan canonically never does grow up. It is the first and main thing that we know about him. All children except one grow up is the opening line of chapter one, Peter Breaks Through of the novel Peter and Wendy, penned by J.M. Barry in 1911. There is no argument or excuse to be made for aging up Peter Pan. Before I get into my full breakdown and discussion of this text, I would like to include a few things about myself that I think are relevant for you all to know. Currently, I consider myself as gender fluid. It took me a very long time to realise what this was and how I felt about it. And to be honest, most of the time, I actually feel more trans than fluid. I have felt like related to and wanted to be a boy for pretty much as long as I can remember. And actually, Peter Pan has a great deal to do with that, which I only realised upon looking back over my own childhood. Peter Pan was my first ever favourite story, and my first ever favourite character, and he continues to be my favourite character in all of fiction. I got my hair cut short as a child so that I could feel more like him, and I have really never stopped feeling that way. Also, I suppose relevant is that I am also pansexual. I understand, encourage, and applaud everyone who needs to, to find out who they are, to be comfortable in their own skin, and to be happy, truly happy in their lives. With all that being said, though, please, while doing that, do not take a child character and manipulate them into some twisted sexual fantasy just because you might happen to relate to them. As I read this book, there were three main things that made me feel very uncomfortable. So in order to discuss this book and talk about the issues, I'm going to break this video down into three sections. Part one, and the most problematic of all, this book, no matter how you try to dress it up, is sexualizing a child. Number two, this book sets out to be some sort of sequel, 
and yet has no continuity or regard for its source material. And part three. This story is quite poorly put together. There is no way around this. Peter Darling is a story which sexualizes a child. Sure, Peter has been aged up, but as I previously stated, that is not appropriate for this character, nor does it really make a great deal of difference. Because despite being an adult, Peter still thinks and acts much like he did as a child, when he's not flirting with Hook. He still crows, he still calls himself the captain of the lost boys, he becomes childishly irritated when Ernest, a new lost boy, is taller than he is. He skips about as he moves and flies. He laughs off hurt feelings and upsets rather than face them. He still refers to himself as a boy and still as the spirit of youth and joy as well. Hook also describes Peter as though he still sees him as a child as well. Most notably, after the two have kissed for the first time and Peter has just admitted to being a virgin, Captain Hook says, Proud and insolent youth. Which is a line Captain Hook used to describe the child Peter Pan in the original story while they were fighting on the Jolly Roger. That is a sickening jolt of an attempt to shoehorn in a callback that some may recognise. Boyish grin is another description Hook has for Peter. He also watches him sleep while wearing Hook's coat, which is far too big for him, conjuring up more childlike imagery, much like when Hook watched the sleeping Peter before he poisoned his medicine cup. My personal least favourite and most jarring of all is when Hook is looking at Peter and thinking to himself that Peter still has the boyish vulnerability in his face. If you are going to tell an adult story with adult content, you need to be using adult characters. Peter, in Peter Darling, does not get seen by others or come across himself as an adult. He reads like a child in an older body who gets thrust into sexual situations by an author who has no care or regard for the character that they are writing. Peter Pan is an eternal boy, a child who does not understand sex or sexuality and nor does he want to. Aging him up just to be able to explore sexuality and sexual ideas with him, as I said earlier, is so very wrong. Especially because he is written as still having the maturity and mental state of a child. But you know what makes it even worse? This character is not even a well-written imitation of Peter Pan. When you are writing a follow-on, continuation, adaption or sequel, surely the first thing to do is get very well acquainted with the original. This story has next to nothing in common with Barry's original work. In fact, as I was reading through it, I found myself thinking that the only remnants of the true Peter Pan story left were a scattering of names. You know what, perhaps I should be glad of that. Now, I would never expect anybody to be quite so well versed in Peter Pan lore as I am, but really, a very basic grasp on the essentials of the story does not take a lot of effort. There were two initial clues that hinted to me that this story and its author paid absolutely no heed to the tale that Barry wrote. First, in the second chapter, chapter one but after the prologue, when Peter is remembering how he got back to the Neverland, it is described that he was following Tink's directions to the second star on the right. Anyone who is even cracked open the original story will know that there is no star. Second to the right and straight on until morning. That, Peter tells Wendy, is the way to the Neverland. He invents it. It's a completely invented direction. Disney actually added in the star when they did their animated version. It is a small and very picky nitpick of mine to be sure, but again, so simple to check if only you read the source material. My second clue came when Peter was getting to the home under the ground. It is described thusly. A portly tree with wide branches had served as the Lost Boys hideout since Peter had first assembled their company. What is wrong with this, you may ask? Well, I'm about to tell you! Again, 
One glance at the source material will tell you that the home under the ground is not made out of one tree. There are many trees as entrances, but each child has one apiece. A tree per person to get down into the home under the ground. But where can we find a single tree access point hideout? Oh, oh, wait for it. The Disney version again. There is also a similar hideout in the 2003 film. Both of those adaptions are inaccurate more often than not, but both of those are more fun, engaging, and enjoyable than this. It became clear to me as I was reading that the inspiration for writing this story probably came from just watching those movies a couple of times. The way the story of Peter Darling explains the Neverland is also odd, once more showing minimal to no research having been done at all. Predominantly because the lost boys and pirates are described as being imaginary, companions dreamed up by Hook and Peter. However, the pirates and Lost Boys are actually very real. The pirates each have names and individual backstories penned by Barry. The Lost Boys are real and alive children who were lost and not claimed within seven days and so sent to the Neverland to defer expenses. Robbing them all of their very existence is strange at best. There is very little world building and what there is is underdeveloped and inconsistent with not just the original source material but also with itself. Mr. and Mrs. Darling too are done very dirty by this story. Mrs. Darling is hardly mentioned. When she is, she is simply ignoring the wishes of her child, Peter. Mr. Darling has been made into an abusive demon. It appears that in a desperate bid for a tragic, unhappy backstory, these two characters had to be warped and mangled into the most disturbing depiction of terrible transphobia. In truth, the original Mrs. Darling would love her children no matter what. And Mr. Darling actually put himself into Nana's kennel to live as penance for the terrible things that he regretted doing at the beginning of the story when he lost his children. It is a vicious slander to them both to turn them into the villains of this piece. Particularly when there are two characters almost ready-made that you could have done the same thing with. If you want terrible parents for Peter, why not use the very parents that he ran away from? The ones who were looking ahead into his future and describing what he was going to be, ignoring the fact that he was a child and didn't want to be that way. We know little to nothing about the parents who barred their window on Peter. So they are blank slates, ripe for the picking. Why not use them as these terrible characters instead of warping poor Mr. and Mrs. Darling? While the idea of Peter Pan being a wistful existence that Wendy dreamed up to be able to exist as the boy he truly feels that he is, is an interesting premise, by merging these two characters into one, Wendy herself has effectively been erased from a story which, including the original, does suffer from a distinct lack of females, particularly this version. Personally, of course, I have never enjoyed Wendy. She was far too keen on growing up for me as a child and an adult. I don't relate to her very much, but I still admire and respect everything that she is and stands for and brings to the table. This story is lacking many things and the existence of Wendy Darling as her own character is one of them. I did not find it a clever plot reveal or twist when the backstory flashbacks were shown to be Peter experiencing life as Wendy. I instead felt that it was a clumsy, lazy dismissal of an entire character. But more on that in the third section of this video. Peter himself is also pretty unrecognisable. Save for a few actions and lines of parroted dialogue, he is absolutely nothing like the original Peter Pan. No care has been given to fleshing him out, no effort taken to understand him. He is just an angry, confused young man who happens to also be able to fly. Hook is in a similar boat, pun intended. His story has been hollowed out to the very bare bones. At one point, Hook even claims, I never really thought of myself as a villain. I was barely even vicious before Peter Pan came along. This is another instance of just not reading the source material. Captain Jas Hook was a fearsome, dreaded pirate long before the coming of Peter Pan, long before he even set foot on the Neverland. He sailed under Blackbeard as his bosun. He was the only man that Long John Silver was ever afraid of. He was so fearsome, in fact, that his ship, the Jolly Roger, did not need a night watchman because she floated immune in the horror of her name. Captain Hook was a fully-fledged and fearsome pirate long before he met Peter Pan and you need only peek at Barry's text to know that. So all of this points me towards one inevitable conclusion. Peter Darling is not, in fact, a Peter Pan sequel, reimagining, or adaption. This is an entirely different story. 
which just so happens to share a few character and place names as Peter and Wendy. So it begs the question, really, doesn't it? Why use these characters at all? To write to them like their true selves in nothing but name? Why even bother? Now, I truly, truly understand the wish and the need to have trans and representative characters. Hell, I really encourage this. I relate very strongly to any person or character who has ever looked down at their body and gone, this isn't me. But this was not the character to do it with. Perhaps, like me, you relate very strongly to Peter Pan. Perhaps as you got older, you then decided that, ooh, maybe I fancy Captain Hook. Those two feelings separately are absolutely fine. There is nothing wrong with them. But why bring them together? Why can Captain Hook's lover not be a new character? Why does it have to be this child? Just because you relate to them? The tale of a struggling trans character falling in love with a pirate is pretty cool as it is on its own. Why bring Peter Pan into it at all? In order for this story to use Peter Pan as a character, they first had to age him up which is fundamentally not what the boy who never grows up would ever do. Secondly, they had to strip him of his entire backstory. Thirdly, they had to strip him of most of his personality. And fourth, they had to merge him with another character, Wendy. That is just too many hoops to create and struggle through, simply in order to be able to use the name Peter Pan. For me, Peter Darling suffers from the same problems as the cursed child. It tries to use too many repeat scenarios of the original work, while also failing to be even remotely recognisable as related to it. Tinkerbell dies, Hook and Peter fight, there are mermaids, at the very end characters sail off on a ship out of the Neverland, and yet none of that hits as hard or as well as the tale it's attempting to piggyback off. The plot itself is also pretty poorly paced, it honestly reads as though a handful of flirtatious and smutty scenes were penned first and then the rest of the story was hastily cobbled together to fit around them. Prime example from early on. Peter and Ernest are hurrying to go and find a magical flower which is going to save the dying Curly's life. This is a matter of life and death. This is a time-sensitive issue and both boys know it. Ernest, in particular, as the new leader of the Lost Boys, has been written as doggedly determined to defend, save and protect them. However, after all of the attempted tension and the ticking clock has been built up, the two boys suddenly decide to stop and take a pause at a stream. Sure, Ernest has taken some wounds, which he cleans, but after that, they still remain there. Ernest, in fact, encourages Peter to get undressed and take a bathe, which he does. And then we go on for page after page after page, where they have a conversation about being shy about their bodies, which could have been done in one page, and there is no sense of urgency for their mission at all. This is a juddering halt to the tension built previously. Are we, the reader, supposed to forget about Curly dying while these two engage in a rather awkward, almost flirtatious bath scene? It makes no sense. As I was reading, I felt that that scene, being so out of place and out of speed with the previous ones, must mean that it was written first, and then all the other ones were written as an excuse to just get there. The rest of the story is pretty much the same. Contrived reason after contrived reason to get Peter and Hook fighting or alone together or quite literally on top of one another. It bites of cliches and a lack of planning. The ending too is pretty poorly cobbled together. At the end of the story, Hook has absolutely no reason to want to leave the Neverland, but suddenly he does because he has remembered who he used to be. And who is that? A very depressed man with a dead family and a dead love interest. Peter does not want to leave. In the Neverland, he has the body he is comfortable in, he can fly, he can have adventures, and he is finally able to forget the abusive family that was so cruel to him and would not let him exist as Peter, instead forcing him to adopt the identity of Wendy. But of course, because Hook has suddenly decided he must leave, Peter decides he must go with him. The entire ending is rushed and it has a distinct lack of reasoning behind the decisions being made. Some might take all of this, the forced flirtation, the cliches, the poor planning, and proclaim that this work is nothing but bad fanfiction. But I am not saying that, because I think that that implies that fanfiction itself is somehow automatically bad, or always inferior to other works. Now, I have read some bad fanfiction, and yes, a good portion of fanfiction is bad, but so are a portion of 
published novels, films, TV shows and stage shows. This story is like fan fiction in that it is set in an AU, alternative universe, but it is distinctly lacking the fan. Personally, I read quite a lot of fan fiction. I sometimes read smutty fan fiction. Hell, I write fan fiction. Badly. Fan fiction can be a brilliant and immersive way to explore and continue stories, worlds and characters. I do want to make it very clear at this point that I am not slandering fan fiction, sequels, adaptions or retellings just for being those things. What I am saying is that unless they are crafted with care and attention taken to at least understand the original source material, then these new stories can just end up feeling like hollow replicas. What I would encourage most of all is to take inspiration from a character and write your own. That way they can be whoever you want them to be and you can explore their story fully without the character themselves being weighed down by precarious strings tying them to the original. You can also, of course, avoid the mess that comes with having to age up child characters. The parts of their personality that you didn't really like or want to include are no longer a problem. And picky fans such as myself will have nothing to pick on. The idea of exploring gender within the story of Peter Pan is an interesting one. Peter himself can very easily be a metaphor for a trans experience, but it does not need to be literal. I think it would be good to write about a trans lost boy or girl character. I don't think Peter himself would have any problems calling them by a different name. I also don't think it would be too much of a problem to swap from lost boy to lost girl or vice versa or any combination there above. Barry describes how Peter is indifferent to appearances and hardly ever pauses to take time to think. So really, he wouldn't care. Going back to the original story once again, the fairies that Peter has lived with for many, many moons are described like this. The mauve ones are boys, the white ones are girls, and there are other colours who don't know what they are. As far back as the 1904 play, the Peter Pan story has had examples of different genders and identities. This could easily have been explored instead of the awkward ageing up story of Peter Darling. So, Peter Pan himself and the inhabitants of the Neverland would likely not have reacted in any way negatively towards a trans, a gender, gender fluid, any different type of gendered character. If you want to tell a story in this setting which explores the negativity that can unfortunately sometimes come with these life experiences, you could have their family, much as they tried to do in Peter Darling, be the cause of this upset and negativity. Perhaps this lost child's family rejected them, and this is why they are lost, and the very reason they are on the Neverland coming to terms with their identity as a person. That is a much better story. Peter himself could be a boy, a girl, or neither. His story is the same regardless. A child who flies out of their nursery window, lives with the birds and the fairies in Kensington Gardens, goes on to the Neverland and stays an eternal child just having adventures? That story stays the same, whether it's about a girl, a boy, or anybody else. Peter is relatable either way. The story Peter Darling did not actually include enough about Peter as a trans character. Of course, being transgender should never be the only personality trait that a character has, but we did not hear enough about it from his perspective to make it even relevant or necessary to the story as a whole. This really does make it read like pretty poor representation of trans people, especially when I in particular should be relating to it. Ironically, I feel that me and the author do in fact have quite a lot in common. However, unfortunately, it does not translate through their work. There has been such a huge lack of LGBTQ plus representation in media for a long time. But the lacking of representation in general should not mean that we latch on desperately to any representation we do get, regardless of its quality. The book's dedication really seems to say it all. This book is for every villain who ever inspired a queer awakening. A pre-warning then, before we even begin to read. This book is just an excuse for enemies to lovers slow burn flirtation. And unfortunately, it drags a canonically eternal child down with it. If you made it to the end of this video, then sincerely thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate I've been doing a lot of Peter Pan content recently, but it's a very, it's a very, very, very important topic to me. And as soon as I knew that this story existed, I, I couldn't not read it. I had to know what someone had done with this story that I love.
I appreciate that this was a much more serious topic than I usually talk about on this channel and next week I promise wholeheartedly to come back with a ridiculously stupid and very light-hearted video but if you have taken the time to pay attention to this and whether you agree with me or not thank you for at least taking the time to hear me out I have tried very hard to hear the other side of this out I watched a lot of reviews where people were talking about this book I read a lot of reviews where people were talking about this book I read both sides of the argument for and against the aging up of characters regardless of who they are I like to be informed about what the other side of a debate is thinking so if you are one of the people who disagrees with me then genuinely thank you for at least hearing me out as usual I will read and respond to as many comments as I can so if you have anything you would like to say down below feel free to do so I don't like being negative I tried to find a positive ending for that so I guess go out and create some characters go out and make some cool content go out and do, do some happy things spread some joy do all of that um, I am actually about to go and film some commission videos and share some joy that way so again thank you genuinely for paying me any attention at all I will see you next Monday for another Monday Madness video and I will see you on Friday where I am going to be doing my first Morku's Friday Tales so that's going to be interesting uh, so yes thank you thank you for watching this video I will let you go now enjoy the rest of the internet goodbye I'm on chapter bloody two what is this Oh, read your source material! Alright, so we're just like rewriting Captain Hook's backstory now. I'm halfway there. This isn't sexy, this isn't hot, this is sexualizing a child. I have many thoughts.